everybody. Welcome to the first episode of Trilogy Talk. I'm here with Dallas Wrinkle and Derek Brookard, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit of Trilogy with you today. Um, before I get started too much, let me just tell you a little bit of behind the vision, a little bit about myself. Um, I watch a lot of podcasts. I'm a fan of a lot of podcasts. Disc Golf Answer Man, On the Box, Smashbox, Ulti World. Um, I spent a lot of my time watching those podcasts and I really enjoy them and I really wanted to kind of get involved into something. I have a big interest in the trilogy world, so I wanted to create something a little bit more casual, a little bit more for the fans, by the fans concept. So that's ultimately what I'm going to do here with the Trilogy Talk podcast. It's not necessarily a set podcast, it's not necessarily going to come out every week um, as we have things to talk about, as I have guests that want to be in here with me or as I travel then we'll set up a podcast for you. So a uh, little bit about myself. I started disc golfing in 1995. I've been playing for quite a long time. My PDGA number is 12824. I've played for a lot of various manufacturers. But uh, in the mid-2000s, I met Jeremy Rusko when he was still just selling discs out of the back of his trunk. And I got to know him. In around 2011, I was moving from Wisconsin to Kansas City. And he asked me to take over the Kansas City store, or to build the Kansas City store um, for Dynamic Discs. So I moved down here and ultimately I did that for him. I ran that for a few years. But just to kind of give a quick um, history on that is, when I first started, I was a big collector. And I collected a lot of manufacturers, but more specifically like The Rock. But what really brought me into Trilogy was, in December 2012, I was lucky enough to sit in on a meeting with Jeremy Rusko and Eric McCabe and a few others when Dynamic Discs decided to become a manufacturer. I knew right away, right then, that I wanted to be there from day one. I wanted to be a part of Dynamic Discs, Latitude 264 and Westside from day one. As a collector, I collect specifically just Dynamic Discs, but as a whole, I love the entire trilogy world and I knew I would from day one. I'm a uh, sponsored player with Team Latitude 64. Um, I've been exclusive with Trilogy pretty much since the very beginning. The moment we found out they were, uh, we had become a manufacturer, I started weeding out molds so I could be 100% supportive. And I've been doing that pretty much ever since. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, I run a lot of tournaments. Uh, that's probably the other big thing I do, but the podcast, learning the video. So, But let's uh, switch from me a little bit. We're going to get our two co-hosts here, the, our weekly co-hosts. We're going to start with uh, Derek Brooker, and he's going to tell us a little bit about himself. Um, I've been in disc golf since early 2013, I believe. Uh, my brother-in-law got me into it. We were down at the Ozarks on a just a weekend, you know, weekend getaway. And uh, he had just gotten into disc golf, and there was a local course down there. He wanted to go play, and I'd seen it before, never really played. Sounded interesting, sounded fun, so... We went out and through this mountainside Ozark course that wasn't even complete that kicked my butt. And uh, we went straight from there over to Lori, Missouri and played another course. Uh, found my first disc on the ground. I thought it was in heaven. Nice star wraith and I could throw it a long way. And uh, then I found out I had to give it back because I had a phone number on it. Was that the Vichy <clears throat> course? The what? Was the course in Vichy? No, it was Lori, course? Missouri. Oh, um, Missouri. All I, all I really remember about this course is I left there with probably 600 ticks on me. <laughs> <laughs> nice little hillbilly course, wasn't maintained as much anymore. And uh, then I got, as I got into the disc golf scene, Kansas City with, you know, with, with you running all the tournaments up here and Dynamic Disc Kansas City, it was all trilogy stuff. So that's really all I've ever known. I think my first trilogy disc was a vision. And I can <laughs> throw it really well and I loved it. I still have it. I don't bag it anymore, but... Um, and now I, everybody knows me. I'm the guy who runs Truly Unique Disc Golf. Um, huge collector. Uh, mainly, mainly focus on, on prototypes these days. The collection started to get a little out of control and I started to run out of space. And, uh, so yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Okay. My first disc was a pain. As you said, I was sitting here thinking like, man, we're not... But it was um, pretty positive. It was a pain because when I first, uh, in 2012, when we became a manufacturer, the very first disc I'd gotten this first set di four discs that I had a pain in my. my yeah, a lot of those discs. old discs, so, Vision Pain. They don't they don't yeah. get the love they used to, but 
All really good discs. Yeah. See, my first was the Warden from your Heritage Fundraiser tournament. Okay. That yeah. was first dynamic disc, trilogy disc I ever got. <laughs> the white disc with the black? No, it was all black, which was a mistake because I oh. lost it <laughs> like a month later. Right. Which, uh, but my name's Dallas. I'm 18 right now. I'm a freshman in college at Pittsburgh State University. Uh, I've been playing for about two years and a half now, coming up on three this May. Uh, right now, I'm pretty new, but like I'm on the trying to go pro side. I don't have the money to collect, uh, so I just like throwing disc. Uh, what I've been, I played baseball pro all my life essentially, until this was the first year I didn't play baseball. I broke my hand first day of tryouts, so that was. <laughs> Oh, the sign from God, I call it, but yeah. Is that like, was that last year or the beginning of the 2018? Yeah. I yeah, remember that. Yeah. Uh, so I took disc golf super serious this year, and I jumped up like 50 points in ratings. I'm trying to go up more, but yeah. Uh, haven't, been, haven't been playing long, but as soon as I got, I played that first round with my friend, I got hooked instantly. I feel like that's how most people are. So. Yeah, I remember you uh, when we did the fundraisers. Yeah, um, I remember you came out to Heritage, and then the next day you came out to Shawnee Mission. Yeah. and I think Shawnee Mission is the first memory I actually have. I remembered your name the day yeah. before, but then when I physically saw you, I was like, "Hey, saw this guy two days in a row." Yeah, I know most everybody in Kansas City. So when I yeah saw your name, I you're gonna realize have a Ricky Wasaki story here in a couple of years. Oh, I know. <laughs> Left baseball and yeah, yeah. Champion. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was a uh, it was a sign from God, I think, because. Disc golf's a whole new story, and it's so much more fun, I think. So addicting. It is. <laughs> I start to shake when I haven't played in a couple days. I got to play in 2019. What? Nope. <laughs> so, all right. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, let's talk, we'll talk a little bit about Trilogy here. And uh, got a few questions that we've kind of put together, and we're going to kind of go over them. We definitely could go down a rabbit hole or two. We'll see what happens. But, uh... So 2019 season is getting ready to start. We're just shy of, what, two months um, of the first uh, national tour and um, disc golf pro tour event with the Las Vegas Challenge and the Memorial. So, uh, but in the off season, you know, we've had a lot of changes. A lot of people have uh, switched manufacturers. Uh, a lot of people have come and go. But a lot of the big names that we've been used to in the trilogy world, more specifically the Latitude 64 world, um, have, have gone and we've got a uh, new player as of uh, real recently with Grady Shue very excited to see what he can do but we've got a lot of up-and-coming players so uh, with the big names more specifically on the men's side for latitude like Wysocki leaving Devin Owens leaving Felberg leaving um, who are you excited to see who do you think is gonna step up who's gonna be the next main person for latitude or um, even Trilogy, just to be that premier player. Wait, hold up. Devin Owens left? Yep. When did that happen? Well, yeah, Devin, really? yeah, Devin sat that. on the news for a while. He announced, I, I believe, right after the first of the year, oh. he went to Innova. Oh, okay. Did not yeah. hear about that. Oh, uh, so if you were for... coincidentally worked out okay for me. I bought a few collector discs <laughs> when I needed, so... Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so you're looking forward to Dallas. Who's uh, who's going to step it up? Uh, I think Gray Shoe is going to have a good year. I mean, he's going to have a lot more options to throw. I think that'll benefit him. Uh, but I think uh, through the whole family, I think uh, Kyle Webster is going to have a good year. I mean, he's, I looked at the schedule and he's playing like every tournament plus more. So I think he's going to hit it hard. I, play, I got to know him Somewhat well down in Joplin, and he's a great guy, great player. I think he'll have a good year. I think he gets overshadowed a lot. Yeah. He does, yeah. Let's see what he does. He's doing uh, good with a lot of stuff with video. I know with learning oh, yeah. how to do this, I've been I picked his brain a little bit uh, in the next gen finale. Oh yeah. To talk about some stuff, so he's doing a lot to push West Side. Oh yeah. From there, um, for me, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to see Grady Shoe um, step up. I'm very excited to see. What Kyle Webster going on tour for the first time. Zach Melton, um, he's probably the one I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do. There's a lot of other players that are up and coming. I know Eric Oakley, he's been doing a lot of off-season trainings. But uh, for me, Zach is kind of the one I think is the next one to kind of step it up. 
I'm excited to see what Zach could do um, along with Grady from the guys side. Um, Paige Pierce has been very dominant but uh, I think uh, little Paige, Paige Bier, because she's going to have a good year as well. Oh, yeah. She uh, had last year uh, or 2018 was kind of her rookie touring year. She got a lot of experience. She's got the world championship under her belt. I think she's hungry for a national tour or a disc golf pro tour win, a, you know, a huge win to kind of solidify that world championship. So uh, I think uh, by the end of the year, you're going to see the two pages just being very dominant. I mean, they're already both very good, and Paige oh, yeah. Pierce is obviously the dominant one, but I think you're going to have the two times Paige and I think Zach Mountain. So that's kind of who I think is going to step up. And So what do you think, Derek? I'd like to see Zach step up um, and and kind of take over that, that spot for Trilogy. I mean, right now, there's a lot of people questioning who is in that spot. Is it Johnny? Who, you know, who yeah. is... Who is Trilogy's top guy? And a lot of people saying, "Hey, you know, we lost, we lost everybody." And I think that's so far from true. I mean, mm -hmm. we lost, you know, a couple big names, yeah, but one world champion and a bunch of guys are still here who can easily step up and oh, fill yeah. that role. Um, I'm, I'm personally, am way, way more excited about the girls' side. Um, <laughs> I look, obviously, I have a, you know, I have a little bit of invested in uh, in Paige Mirkus. She's, she's on our team and. Um, I think she's just. I don't, I I would have called her a sleeper pick, but not anymore. She kind of just kind of took over the reins and said, "Yep, I'm not a sleeper. I'm right here. I'm gonna battle." And um, but I think between her and Paige Pierce, and and I'm really hoping to see something out of Rebecca Cox this year. I mean, she's always up there, but I'd like to see her fighting for those top three spots every time. You know, I think I think the top three women could be trilogy if it, if it plays out right. So. That's that's what I'm most excited to see, I think. And I, I I'm not nine seventy rated like somebody mm -hmm. is, you know. So for me, I actually enjoy watching the women way more than the men. I'd much rather watch the women. I can I can relate more to what they're throwing and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm never gonna be nine seventy, so um, Maybe someday. Yeah. I'm not like forty ish. <laughs> I've been in the nine sixties. My rating, I have the hope. My rating's going right. the wrong direction. Yeah. And the more I work, the less I play and <clears throat> Yeah. So <laughs> For real. Well, I think it's going all right so far. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, so next question here is Dallas actually put in this question. So I'm gonna let da Dallas ask the question um, or elaborate on it a little bit more. <clears throat> but his question was, should our pars change to be harder? Elaborate on that. Okay. So I see this question all over Facebook. Even like when I go out like out of town tournaments, like it's kind of like a regional thing. Like Oklahoma, I guess everything's a par three. Where like I would say in Kansas City, we got some easy par fours. I don't know. They're they're tweeners, but it's all over Facebook. Like tweeners for a guy who throws. Okay. Well, I mean, even for the <laughs> uh, But like, should pars be changed to be harder, or should we keep like where? Pros are shooting 30 down through a tournament, pretty like every weekend. And honestly, I think I don't know that with the UDIS app and like seeing like what scores like average out to like a 3.5 or something. I think we should probably change some of them because there's a lot of scores where it's like a 200 foot like straight shot where it's a par three, but then you got like a 450 foot dog leg through the woods that's also a par three. And it's like I feel like we need more of like a standard. On what should be threes and fours and stuff. So par based more on, on how it's laid out. Uh, I'll say like more what it averages. Well, I'll say from a designing standpoint, when it comes to pars, um, I know at least with my courses, I look at that a lot. I think a lot of courses that, especially throughout the country, are on that old school mentality of everything's a par three. Yeah. So it'd be a six hundred foot hole, and the sign says par three, yeah. even though we know it's probably a par five. Yeah. So I think a lot of signs. Um, or even apps or however whoever puts those things in are based on that old school thinking yeah. from there. I think as far as should pars be harder, I think it depends on who you're catering to in my yeah. opinion. It's if you're just catering to the UDISC app and yourself, a 60 is a 60. Yeah. So whether you say 600, 6 over, it doesn't mean anything. However, when we look at like world championships, and we've had world championships in the past that shoot 60 under for a yeah. tournament. Dave Beldberg back in 2008, I think, shot like 100. I don't know for sure, but I think it was really extreme yeah. like that. And I think then when you start looking at outside entities compared to traditional ball golf, yeah. and they look at 100 under, 50 under, yeah. that's starting to look easy. Yeah. You know, so if you're looking at it, I think from an outside entity, I think pars should be um, 
are definitely should be adjusted to be accurate. Yeah. I think holes that are tweeners, I mean, some are just tweeners, some you yeah. don't have the space and you can't do anything about. Yeah. I think they should be adjusted. I know I personally, on several of my events, anybody who's paid attention to my courses sees I'm always kind of just moving a basket 10 feet here and there because I'm trying to just, even those little 10 or 20 foot changes yeah, can make a hole sure. harder to make it more of a legitimate three or four. But not every course has those um, course coordinators or the ability, a lot of parks, you have to go through a lot of rigmarole to just make a change really like that. So, I mean, we're very lucky where we're at here with a lot of parks, but it's definitely not that easy. So I think it should be changed based on just well, depending I, on who's looking at I it. I personally would say, you know, a tweener should be a par three. You know, yeah. it's okay to have to bust your tail to get a par three. Yeah. You know, they shouldn't all be, you can park under the basket and you can tap it in for a three. Yeah. <clears throat> um, no, I'm, I mean, I personally, I see ball golf scores that after, you know, after a long week of tournament, they're in the, you know, negative 20, negative 25. Yeah. But I think the difference in disc golf is we're getting into much larger numbers. Like yes. you said, 60, 65, 70, yeah. you know, and we're not, we're not all pros, but at the same time, if you're not a pro, you know, it, it's okay to not go out there and shoot even par. It's okay to be six over, eight over, 10 yeah. over, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. And it's okay for, I mean, look at, if you do look at ball golf, if, if a guy like me goes out, you know, who in ball golf is an amateur, you know, it, equivalent to maybe an intermediate disc golfer, yeah. I'm going to shoot 20 over. And that's okay. You know, but so why in disc golf do I, do I shoot three over or four over, you yeah. know, yeah, or something like that, you know, it's easy, it's, I feel like we compare a lot to, to ball golf and if, not saying I love that, but if we're going to compare to ball golf, yeah. it's okay to be in those larger numbers, you know. I don't think that necessarily scares people away from the sport or anything else. I mean, it just says, hey, you're not at top level. You no, know? I don't think those par numbers scare individuals from who are wanting to play. I think most people who are wanting to play probably really don't even look at that the par. They might look on the UDISC app at yeah. what an average person is <clears throat> shooting to determine what the difficulty of a course is. But uh, I don't know that I've ever heard of anybody saying, oh, the average person shoots a 10 under out here. I'm not playing that course or I'm not going to play the game. I do think, though, when you start looking at. No, but I think I, I personally think disc golfers have the mentality. Oh, man, I shot 10 over. That was an awful round. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. realistically, if you go out and ball golf and shoot 10 over, most people at, at the oh, amateur wow. level are pretty darn happy. Yeah, I'm pretty happy I mean, about that. Yeah, I find most people, though, that. When they they look at the raw number and they that's what they dictate whether they shot good or not. I mean, I'll see after a tournament, it's like, you know, what'd you shoot? And I was like, I stunk. I shot ten over. But by the time you figure out, look at their rating and everything, and where they're sitting, they're sitting exactly where they should be in their division. But they see that number and they see ten over or seventy or eighty, and right away they just kind of cringe and it's like well, that is not good at all. Especially when they go to compare against one a high end pro as I'll play the same layout, same course. And they'll beat them by 20 strokes. Yeah. So they automatically, I remember um, one of the first times, and I still dabble in advance and open, but I remember one of the first times I ever played open, I played, um, I believe it was the Shungananga here in Topeka, Kansas, and I think I got last or second to last. Um, but I was at the top in advance. Okay. But I remember feeling so bad about the round at the time. I was still like a 940 rated golfer, the same I am. This, probably like 10 years ago, so you can see I haven't improved in 10 years. But uh, but I was still where I should be, but looking at that raw number, you know, looking at that par, looking at that score, yeah. it just felt horrible. And I remember leaving wondering, kind of like a lot of people do, is like, why am I playing? Did I move too soon? Yeah. And it wasn't until I looked at advance to see where I sat that I was like, oh, well, okay. If I had moved, I would have been the fine, or I would have been just fine, but... Do you, do you think it hurts like outside like ESPN like if they looked at like what we're uh, like what Joe Mess is putting out and they're like do we want airless and they see like pros 30 down like do you think they want to show that because of that or if it's like I don't think yet yeah um, I don't think it's looked at quite like that just yet okay um, I mean maybe someday yeah you know but um, I've never seen anything on the um, any articles like that sports center top 10 yeah. or anything like that. That if, I mean, they make their little. I do feel like there, though, a negative forty, negative fifty can't send the wrong impression, especially yeah. to somebody that's not knowledgeable. Yeah. yeah. Golf. Almost like, oh, this sport's easy. This is yeah. Like sport, give it know? like that, like a putt putt type like right. feel. Like yeah. It's just a it, it just makes them, you know, 
When, Makes them think it's easier than it is. Yeah, Makes when them in think reality, it's, less of a sport it's than fantastic, really like a 20 down or something. I tell a lot of people, I, I've always said, uh, I think disc golf is one of the easiest games to play, mm -hmm. but it's also one of the hardest games to learn. Right. And by the time you really look at I mean, just throwing a disc, walking down, getting the basket, regardless how many times you threw it, um, is not hard to do. But to figure out the angles, the nose up, the nose down, you know, all the different variations of discs, um, the disc manufacturers. And I know other sports like golf and have those same type of things. But um, I guess when I've learned to play traditional golf, I only use a few clubs. Yeah. And my clubs or my ball aren't wearing out like they do on a disc. Yeah. You know, they get chipped up. And even as you're learning, and next thing you know, you've got three or four molds. Well, until you know that stuff, it's hard. Um, just trying to, you watch people throw a disc that for you looks extremely hard left. But the next person is throwing it dead straight. Yeah. They know how to throw it. Um, it's just they're on just that angle, just enough that the hips, the legs, the shoulders, the head. There's so many mechanics that throw it well, but it's easy to play. I think it's just hard to be good at. Yeah. I don't know. So. All right. So. So the next question we have here um, actually was brought in from or was submitted to me personally from uh, one of our future watchers, since this is our first episode, I guess I can't say he was an actual watcher yet, but uh, Jordan Renzelman submitted this, and uh, he's a trilogy player, he throws um, exclusively trilogy, but he asked me how I felt about discs being uh, released in TFR only, as opposed to being made as a stock, um, and for those who don't know, TFR is the tournament fundraising program that Dynamic Discs provide to tournament directors for tournaments. So if you're running a local event and you want to have custom stamped discs, you can go through Dynamic Discs. They'll give you a spreadsheet full of a lot of discs. Some are stock, but some are exclusive to only those who are doing custom stamps. And with that, you um, purchase them at um, whatever the price is, and you usually get some kind of a la carte uh, gifts, baskets, bags, different swag items, things like that that you can use at your own discretion for your tournament uh, for fundraising, raffle, blah, blah, blah. So but that's really what TFR, but like one of the examples that we had was more specifically was like the Gold Ballista Pro, but like the Moonshine Suspect has been one in the past where that's kind of come through where it's always been a TFR, it's never become a stock. So his question was, is when a new disc comes out like a Ballista Pro that's really popular, it's harder to get. Um, now, I mean, for some people it may not be hard to get because you can get it from eBay, local sales, um, different stores if they run tournaments but if you're in an area that doesn't have a lot of trilogy or that doesn't do have a lot of tournaments it can be hard to get those discs and the Blista Pro being one of the most popular okay. of the trilogy molds at the moment you can only get through certain ways you can't just order it or walk into a store and get it off their stop so so that's the question is how do you feel about fundraiser discs at the at least at the beginning only being offered as fundraising and not as a stock item you want me to go first, Lance? Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> personally, I think it's and I think it's perfect the way it is. Um, I love the fact that you can't get them just any way you want them. Um, it's not easy to build the funds to run a good solid tournament. It, it may be easy to go out and run, you know, a little one rounder or a basic tournament, but to run a good solid tournament takes a lot of money. And when I say a lot of money, I mean we're talking thousands of dollars. Um, so anything extra that a tournament director can get to help them raise funds is, is a good thing. The other thing is a lot of those molds, I think a lot, of, a lot of fans and mainly social media fans don't realize, but um, a lot of those are special blends and things like that, and they're not necessarily the thing that your average golfer, your rec golfer, intermediate golfer, is walking into a store looking for anyway. You know, it's not... I know, just as an example, last year DD decided to let some of the buyback stores have, you know, an opportunity to get some hybrids and things like that, and they didn't necessarily sell off the shelves because those aren't those aren't common everyday blends that, you know, that the average fan walks in and even knows about. You know, those are things that we build hype behind on social media, and people learn that they fly different ways, this, that, and the other, and that's where the popularity comes from. And you need that popularity to be able to go out and build, you know build funds to, to run a good solid tournament um the ballista pro i think i do agree it came out 
as TFR first, but we all know it's coming in stock. We you know we know yeah. that's going to happen. Yeah. That could be a TFR because there wasn't that many that came off the first run. That could be a TFR for multiple reasons. It could be a TFR just because it was it was extremely popular and they didn't want to release the gold line version until this year. You know, there's different reasons they choose to do that. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think they're holding anything back on their fans is what I'm saying, I guess. That gold line blister pro's coming. Yeah. You know, the Moonshine Suspect as an example, that's one of those discs that, you know, when DD places an order, X number of discs need to be ran. Yeah. You know, they can't just go over there and say, Oh, we want three hundred of those. I mean they probably could, but latitudes they they've got no time for that. They you know And we're learning that with the exclusive program. <clears throat> and so, you know, that's a disc that Maybe it needs to be out there, but DD doesn't have the room or shelf space to take up on a disc like that anyway. And they know that the odds of it constantly reselling, you know, yeah. selling out to where they have to restock it is slim. So it fits a great need for a TFR for a tournament fundraiser. Tournament fundraiser comes out, people can raise money off of it, but then they don't have to necessarily, you know, stock a full run of them and, and take up shelf space. You know, there's a there's a lot that goes into that. I don't think a lot of fans necessarily understand all that. Um, so I, I, I have no issue with the program. I think it's great the way it is. Um, the one downside to it, as he said earlier, you know, as a, if you're running just a custom hot stand, you can't access that stuff. Mm. So if you, you know, if you want to run like a limited run on a, an escape and you want to throw it on some hybrid, you can't do that. That's a downside for some people. But again, it's a, it's definitely an upside for a tournament, you know, for a tournament yeah, director really. who's trying to build a lot of funds for a tournament. Okay. So... Um, me personally, I, I love it the way it is. Um, if anything, I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see more options in fundraiser only. You're not a TD, so what do you think? No, uh, honestly, like when I do find like a that gold bullet pro, that's like I pull out my wallet instantly, just because they go far and they're stable. But uh, I mean, not being able to buy it every day, it, I think it it adds like a like a special, like special feel in my bag. I feel like something other people don't have. You make sure you throw it in. Yeah. <laughs> situations. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but like I do know, like there is some like there's more logistics than most people think. Like the Felbird Triple X Moonshine Opto X disc, my favorite disc. Uh, there's problem with the cooling, so they couldn't they can't run like a whole lot at once. But I mean, but I want as many as I can get. Right, and see a lot of those facts, like you just said, yeah. those those leak out on facial, yeah. Facebook, yeah. social media, and stuff. But the average fan doesn't know that. Yeah, like, they don't know why those are like that. Yeah. They don't know why there's such a limited amount of them. That's so, a whole separate um, conversation. It's the, I'll tell you the, the, <laughs> what you yeah. know. If we if you want to bring up the perfect example, it's the soft justice. Yeah, yeah. you know the exactly. whole you know the whole trilogy community wants soft justices, and they just can't wrap their head around the fact that this disc isn't meant to be made that way. It's not. It doesn't like the process, yeah. yeah. You know, and Latitude doesn't want to keep toying with it. For every three hundred they get, Lord knows how many they had to scrap and recycle because they didn't come out. Yeah. yeah. You know, so um, I and going back to what you said a second ago, you you know, when you find a disc like the Goldline Ballista Pro that you fall in love with, you you want to jump on it, you want oh, to yeah. grab it. Well. When you grab it, you're helping out a tournament. Yeah. So it's in the spot it needs to be in. You oh, know? yeah. It, and, Completely. and once that popularity dies down a little bit, then let it go to stock, you know? Exactly. And then you can grab yourself some backups or whatever, but that uh, I, I think it's perfect the way it is. Yeah, yeah. I personally agree. Um, I mean, I like the TFR program. A little bit biased <laughs> from a, as a tournament director. Um, personally, I think there should be more items on STFR. I wish, I'm not going to say all new discs that come out, but one of the problems is, from a tournament standpoint is Derek said it is we have to raise a lot of money to run a good tournament and it just at least at the style tournaments that we run um, you know you can do a little bit less and do less um, and some need more like when I ran the Midwest Amateur Championships or the Worlds those are massive scales compared to Chill to Hill Heritage Hills versus just a very basic entry style tournament um, and then when you're looking at those TFR lists and you've, you've exhausted everything or the bulk of everything that's on there is stock it's really hard to order because you know that I can't sell I have to sell that at minimum of what a store would sell it for but more times you're trying to fundraise so you yeah. might even sell it for a dollar or two more well I can't sell it when the majority of the list is stock items or um, unpopular items but more specifically stock items so when we look at those lists 
we've gotten pretty good over the years that the moment they come out, we <clears> attack <throat> it and we fundraise for it because we know that's the opportunity. But we'll have new discs coming in all the time, but that TFR list doesn't change. And we'll look at it preparing for a tournament. It's like, yep, that's the same list we looked at a month ago or two months ago or four months ago. And uh, But we know a dozen, whether it's molds or plastics or sometimes it's just sparkles or the way they foil. Um, now, you know, um, started getting to these two disc processes and bottom stamps. And there's so many things that we see coming on, but they're not... A f benefiting the tournament director. So I like the TFR program, but personally I wish uh, it had a little, there'd be a, f a few more options first. Um, one, one thing I think I've always, I've always kind of found amusing is, and I understand the average fan probably doesn't think about it, but it's a good opportunity for me to, to let them know, you know, the average fan wants to come out and, you know, I hear a lot of, I hear a lot of people that will complain about a tournament, oh, the player pack wasn't big enough, or this wasn't good enough, or that wasn't good enough. And usually what that boils down to is, all the money used for that tournament was from entry fees and things like that. There wasn't any fundraising. There wasn't anything around it to make that tournament that much better. And so, you know, I think somebody actually had asked a question, on, you know, online to Scott or something, you know, what's keeping people from playing tournaments or what might help people play tournaments? And the fact is that they want better tournaments. But if you want better tournaments, you've got to have money. And in order to have money, you have to have fundraisers. You know, it's like that with anything. You've got to build the funds so that in more TDs building the funds with these fundraisers and more people buying these fundraisers and ha only being able to get them through TDs is what helps build a great tournament. You know, so you want a better tournament, you got to have fundraisers. So you, you can't, it's that old, the old saying, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah. You can't have all this just produced in stock and not help your TD out. If you want a good tournament, you got to help your TD out. It's that simple. So... That's what it comes down to. Yeah. I, do th I do think overall, the, I mean, uh, DD Latitude Westside, uh, they're looking at that. And we, uh, both me and Dirk, we talk to DD pretty regularly about these different things. And uh, so I think they're always trying. And, of course, I think they're, you know, they'll get a new idea and it's stretched thin because DD wants to make their money. Latitude wants to make their money. The bigger the tournaments get, they're becoming more exclusive events, whether it's world championships or... Um, because I don't know what the right word is, but premier events, okay. um, titled events, to where now where these new TFRs come out, they're given to them. So like for Masters Worlds as an example, when I ran it, I got the Lucid Air Emac Truth. Yes. You know, so that was exclusive to me. So uh, many events got something significant like that. So as they grow, unfortunately, and they do still want the TFR program to be good because. They want more and more people to have those custom programs out there to compete with those other manufacturers. It's also harder for them because they're focusing on other things too, so they only have so many molds. And now they even have like this new exclusive program to where other people can start ordering us. They can dream up a mold, or not a mold, but they can dream up a concoction of a various mold that exists within reason, within reason <laughs> and they get it made. So it even kind of takes away from that, but they are still, they're always improving. And I do love that program. I like a lot. I like the stuff that they even do with the premier events. Um, one of the things here that I've noticed real recently that I'm very excited about is, uh, well, last year, you know, when the burst came out, it was very popular at first. A lot of people really liked that burst. So I'm kind of, and I'm kind of segwaying here from TFR to stuff that, um, trilogy the manufacturers are doing but they started with that burst it was very popular at the beginning um, and then over the kind of the year it started to become less popular you know mm -hmm. kind of the joke was you know where people look for collector discs and they want that pre-made in Sweden discs or like for people throw Innova they want the pre-flight number discs yeah. well now it's starting to come out to I would like the pre-burst disc you know yeah. kinds of stuff but they're always improving and now uh, if, I don't know if you guys have seen this past week but they have like the new uh Opto X Pure that's coming yeah. out and it's in a really bright teal and it's metal flake and it's the vibrant. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the disc was, I don't know if it was one of the new uh, discs they're releasing, but they did a disc today that was a real vibrant butterscotchy. Oh, like the, like the yeah, mango color? Yeah. yeah. But uh, even in some of the TFRs they've done recently with the hybrids where they've had that just that super vibrant yellows and pinks. Right. And, yeah. So yeah, I. Fun. I think that's something they're doing that I haven't seen other manufacturers do that is in the right track. Mm -hmm. That going kind of now tying back to the TFRs is depending on where they put those things, I think those are still going to be new future opportunities to 
um, fundraise for tournaments, um, but give tournament directors other options too. Whether I don't, I don't know if those will be on TFR. I hope some degree some of those options become a TFR kind of thing, kind of like the hybrid discs and the full colors. But so that's kind of my opinion on all that, and that wiped out that question too. <laughs> so. All right, so like I said, Trilogy overall, I mean, they're doing good, and they're always trying, and I think they're working, so, but uh, we were just kind of talking about tournaments, of course, one of the biggest Trilogy tournaments is the Glass Blown Open at the end of April in Emporia, and Derek, uh, sitting next to me over here, submitted a question, and I'm going to let him kind of elaborate and ask this question, and... Yeah, my curiosity was uh, what you guys think about the number of events that you can play at the Glass Bone Open, open in just, you know, an eight or nine day period. I can't remember what the number is, but it's a large number, like 20... Is there like two a day? Yeah, it's like, two, isn't it like 23 or... Oh, I can't remember. No. It's, oh, it might be, yeah. It's a, lar it's a large number of oh, events right. that you can cover in an eight or nine day period. Oh, it's exciting. It's a festival. It is I mean, a it's, festival. And it's gotten so big that you can't just show up anymore. You almost have to create tea times or... Well, Shackles the Glass Bone through. Open is only one of those. No, right, the class yeah, There's like open. 22, I, I don't but remember the exact number. I think it even. starts on the Saturday before GBO. Yeah, it, it goes every day, and we're talking, I mean, you're talking flex start, whether they're just flex start events or the events like you do over at Harmony. Double disc, The yeah. double disc events, and then not counting the potting competitions. And um, I know in the past year or two, Pro Tour has been there with their mm -hmm. carnival. Um, but the block party, all the nightly activities, there's always something going on. I know me and Derek have been on staff for the last few years, and there's so much going on. Yeah, every year my wife but laughs, it's, uh, I come back from the meeting, and she says, how long are you going to be there this year? Yep, it moves. It gets and every year more, it's more a little bit longer. <laughs> well, last year I went to Bowling Green AM Championships, and I didn't even play the final day, because I needed to get back here so I could get over to GBL, really? just because I wanted enough time to mail, uh, to get what done what I needed to do when I was teething municipal. But also, uh, so I could enjoy it. Yeah. I didn't want yeah, to be rushed. Glass built into an experience. I don't even feel like it. I don't want to say it's not about the golf because it's definitely about the golf. Okay. But I think from a pro side and stuff, it's about the game. From an AM side, it's more about the experience. Oh, hands down. It's become you know you can go down there and you can you don't even have to play that one tournament. You can still play twenty two other tournaments or something like. And like I don't remember the number. I just know it's in the twenties. Okay. Yeah. It's some. It's a lot. An absurd yeah. number. Yeah. I mean, you can go down there and play Monday through Friday. You can play an XC tier. You can play a C tier. Um, there and like you said, there's stuff on Saturday. There's, there's stuff C tiers that play it's, around your actual competition golf. Yeah, it's you know, it's so, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's stuff that's so. Always I guess my one of one of my questions there is, do you guys feel like it's become too much, or do you feel like the golfers just love this? This is this is you know everything they've dreamed of. Oh. Uh -huh. You go back and ice your arm for a week. <laughs> oh, I didn't throw after that for a while. Uh, I I think it's great that like you can do anything at any time, pretty much, just because there's so much going on. I I I love it. I think for like an AM side, it's like the it's the week you look forward like all year. It's like okay, during 64 more days till GBA. Like I think it's something that's creating like a culture around it and. Yeah, I mean, it's bringing people in from all over the world. It's a vacation right. destination. It people is. set yeah, their there was something like 11 countries or something represented yeah, last yeah. year? Like, I it's Emporia, Kansas. Like, never would have thought when I didn't know disc golf. And now, like, I want to go to disc or go to Emporia almost every weekend. Oh, place. yeah, your friends laugh at you when you say, where's your vacation this oh, year? Yeah. Emporia, Kansas. What? Yeah. It's people, like, you couldn't come up with a better place? Yeah, I know. As an older school golfer, I mean, it used to be that when you planned your year out, you planned around the majors. You know, what's made, especially in the day when they were combined or there, the opportunity for AMs and pros to be together, but you would take a seven day vacation and you'd travel wherever the world championship was in the country, and that was the big event. And now this is a major. It has the national tour title behind it, but it's a major. And at 1,600 people, that's bigger than any major combined. I'm pretty sure there has never been another major combined with even pro and AM that have exceeded that. And I'm excited this year they added the Raz round. I think that'll yeah. be oh, they do. That'll yeah. be a blast. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. And they've set it up to where you can actually be out there, be a spectator, and be part of it. I know it does mean an extra day off for some people and yeah. things like that, which can be frustrating, but 
you know, like I said, I feel like most people that are going down there, you know, this is their vacation. Oh, yeah. This is what they're there for. Yeah. Their wife may not be as happy yeah. about it, but, you know. So, well, there's even things for the wives to do. But as a fan, I don't think it's too much. Now, if I'm Doug, you know, probably come... Hey, Doug's responsible for it. He's got a problem with it. I mean, <laughs> May 1st, you know, but no, even he's always positive. And I, I've talked to him many times, and he's still always looking at not necessarily growing that 1,600 person number, but how to make every those 1,600 people have more fun. And, you know, as a TD, and I think Doug does this, but one of my philosophies have always been you can't rely on the competition uh, as a TD. I think, you know, and I'm throwing out this percentage, but I bet 75% of the people who play a tournament are not happy with the way they actually played on the course, um, with how they performed on the course. And if you have a tournament and that's all you have, they're going home unhappy because they didn't play well. But if you have other things like the GBO has or several bigger tournaments have to where there's things that make them happy outside of the competition, the competition becomes a major part of it still. But it's still worth it for them to go. Or if you've got twenty plus opportunities yeah, to do yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you just, walk on winning one of those, you're happy. Yeah, right? I mean, you could get dead last in a division, I think, at GBO, and you still had a blast. Oh, Probably right. more fun than you'd have at any other tournament. Well, yeah, I think and, I, it's. Yeah. I mean, it's grown. My first GBO was, I believe, four years ago, and I was excited to go down there and play as a player and stuff. And I'll be honest, I'm at the, at this stage at, at where I'm at, I don't. There's not a single part of me that wants to play. I don't go down there to play. I go down there because I know I'm going to see seven or 800 disc golfers that I only see once a year. You know, people that through online, I've, I've learned names and stuff like that and never seen a face. Um, unfortunately, I'm, you know, I am pretty busy a lot of times and I don't get to spend more than a couple seconds to shake a hand or whatever. But, you know, it's a chance to see people you don't see. It, you know, and a lot of those guys... That's their one time a year. They know they're going to see some of these yeah. people. You know, yeah. it's a ch it's a chance to to catch up with some of the pros that we know and things like that. And there's you know we're in a game where the pros are so easy to approach and so sociable. You know, oh, yeah. and uh, I mean it's to me it's it's past being about ball. Right. You know, it's just it's just about experience. Well, I've been on staff for I don't know how many years now, and this is my first year of in a long time I'm not working. So I am super excited to be playing, um, and uh, I don't even know how to approach it. Like the courses that we're playing, for the most part, I've never played before. The last seven, eight years, all of, all I've all I've focused on is municipal, and now I'm looking at. Uh, actually, I don't even know this. I looked at the schedule. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I know there's at least one or two, if not two courses that I have never played before. And uh, but the value is, I live an hour away, so an hour, hour and a half away, so. We do have that benefit of being able to at least check oh, it out and, or get, get there a little bit early and without having to invest in all that travel time. So yeah. I think just the fact, like, no matter where you're at, there's a disc golfer somewhere. Like it. It's like I went into Walmart. It's like everyone I look around is wearing, like, a DD shirt or some, like, disc golf uh, clothing on. And it's like, you know, everyone here is for the same thing you're, you love. I remember years ago in 2008, I went to the USDGC in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and I had always seen the pictures before, but when you come into town, they've got the big green sign, the highway sign, that says United States Disc Golf Championship, and it has the exit, and you look at that and you feel like you're someplace special. Okay. You pull into the university and you see the flag wall, and you, just, you haven't even seen the course yet, but you know you're somewhere special, you're excited. But to me, at GBO is a lot like that is, the, uh, you know, when you're coming in from town, especially if you're coming in like from the south, from us, um, we see it every week when we go. But you see the big water tower. Um, a lot oh, of times during that time, you're the big billboard that's yeah. coming in. Yeah, it's you know, Emporia, Kansas on it. Several of the businesses up and down the roads, the Granada, they all say "Welcome GBO Disc Golfers," oh, yeah. and you could walk in any one. I agree. I've been into Walmart and having a disc golf shirt on, and people recognize you, and they oh, want it. They don't just say hi. They're how did you play today? And I know I have to spend a lot of my time answers like, well, I'm not playing, I'm working. Well, Emporia but, has a different feel to me yeah. than, I mean, I've, I've been out of state to, to things before where there's something big going on, a softball tournament or whatever, and the people around the community, they just can't wait for these people to get out of their community, you know? Yeah. Emporia is the other way around. I feel like you go in there and they're welcoming you into their community. You can walk by a little guy on the street walking his dog and he wants to know how he shot. 
Yeah. And he genuinely, it right. seems like he wants to know how he shot. You yeah. know, he's interested. You know, and it they're not just, man, when are these people going to be out of our town, you know? I mean, it's its just a whole different feeling. <clears throat> well, that's the second part of your question? Oh, yeah. The new registration format. Oh, yeah. I was, this year they, uh, I guess they, they changed up registration. You could register by division, and each division had a different day, right? Mm -hmm. So I was... I personally didn't pay much attention to it. Obviously, I didn't have to register. I assume you registered. I did. I did not make it. Uh, I do like the way that they're doing it, though. You did like the format? Yeah. But you didn't make it. I, I'm on the way list. I'm 13th, so. Oh, so you're in. You're yeah. in. Yeah. 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 Uh, but it didn't crash my internet. That's a big plus, because I know <laughs> when you get every division trying to sign up at once, like, it was like just whoever had the fastest internet and praying. Like, that's what it came down to. This year, it's like, OK. <laughs> Uh, like for open, it was like all like international players, international players like any division or any uh, rating. Then like pros over a thousand in the U.S. Then like nine seventy and up, mm -hmm. and then just open. And so I mean that just I they had to make like, Doug's job just a little oh, bit so I'm sure. Yeah. I know the first year, the first year I didn't get in GBO. They they had registration on Halloween, which well, of right. course. Was, was was a little sticky anyway. I've got kids and stuff, so <laughs> yeah. I was busy. We're standing at a trunk or treat in a church parking lot, and let's just say I shouldn't have said a few of the words I said standing on God's ground because I was so mad. I registered. It went through the whole process, and I didn't get in. Yeah. And I, it said I was in. So then I had to register again, and it took it the second time, but by the time it took it the second time, I was on the wait list. Yep. And I... I I had Doug's phone number, so I, just, I jumped on my phone immediately. I'm like, and Doug's like, we'll see what, you know, let's yeah. let's see what's going yeah. on. Apparently, it got hit hard, and things weren't going good or whatever. And then, you know, I slept on it. And I woke up the next morning, I was like, you know what? I'm not in GBO, so we're going to do something different. Yeah. And that's how that's how this whole double disc thing got started in the first place. Mm -hmm. But now I look back on it, and it's kind of like you were saying earlier with baseball. It was a blessing. Oh, I, yeah. I would much rather be down there helping them run these events and stuff and, and adding to this event for everybody that I would play in. Yeah. And, I mean, my chances of going anywhere playing in that tournament are, I mean, yeah. and yeah, I know people, next to none. People so. love those events. I had a friend, he was staying with me down there, and I think he played, like, a, every, like an event every day in the morning before his actual round. And I know he did a lot of, like, the uh, double disc thing or something like that. He's like, yeah, shot great. The double disc is just an amazing warm-up round. Oh, yeah. I exactly. mean, it's not too long. You can get out of there in an hour, 15 minutes or so. Nice warm-up. And it gets you warmed up. Yep. Because everybody knows you show up to the first hole you haven't thrown, and, and the first couple holes suck. Yeah. I mean, that's just yeah. disc golf, right? Oh, yeah. So now you're warm. You go out there. You're ready to go. And yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I got a buddy from Wisconsin who came down, Zach Bay, who's been a part of my staff for the municipal. Um, and he comes and works. But he focuses on when he's not working on everything else. Yeah. You know, he's got his time of when he needs to be out there with me at municipal, but he's hitting those one rounders, he's hitting the nightly activities. Oh, yeah. Even on staff, he's enjoying it. But uh, on the registration process, um, I got in pretty easily, but one of the things I liked about the new process is one, I'm sure it made Doug's job a lot easier, like you just said, but was if I play MP40, so Pro Masters, if it had filled, the nice thing about it is I knew it was like, you know what? Open has an open registered jet. So if I don't get an MP40, I'll get into open. And I've thought about that with AMS as we knew this, we were going to talk about this question was, you know, if you're an intermediate player, as an example, and you don't get in, whatever happened, life's getting away, and you don't register, you don't get in, you can get on the wait list. But you have, maybe you're eligible to play rec or advance, and then you have another day, you know, depending on the process of, I don't remember the exact schedule I was released, but you have another day to kind of say, you know what, I'm going to get in on that day. But the way they had it before when it was all at once, you couldn't register in multiple divisions if you were on a waiting list um, that you were eligible to play. And there's a lot of people who, like, um, and masters who can't put, who don't get in, so they'll go play intermediate or advanced. Yeah. This kind of gives you the ability to think about it, yeah. to man, come up with a backup plan while you're waiting to get in. And like you said, 13 on a waiting list, you'll get in because... So many people do that. They register for multiple divisions, or they register just to register mm -hmm. with no clue whether or not they're even going to be able to play. Oh, yeah. They just don't want to take the chance that come March they decide they could play, 
and now they're locked out. So yeah, I think uh, I like that process. Um, I think it's a. I'd like to see more people go to it. Um, it made it to the internet and crash. I like smooth. I registered for GBL and MP40 for my phone. Yeah. Normally I just do it from the computer because I can't do it well enough on my phone. And but yeah, I'm super excited about the GBLs this year and for everything as oh, a yeah. player and see all the events and. I keep trying to think to myself uh, every time we travel to Emporia, I think we talk about it every summer, that we're going to play more. Because me and Derek, for those who don't know, go to Emporia almost every week. And come summertime, or during the school year time, a lot of times we have to be back by 3 o'clock or so to pick up some kids or something like that, whether I do or he does. But during the summer, we don't have to do that. And I think every summer, we've been doing this for two, three years now, we talk about, like, we should play more often. And we don't. We'll take our bags with us. And we don't. <laughs> so I was like, we really should take advantage of that a little bit more. So, but all right. So um, next question came in. Uh, this one came in from one of our fans up on the Trilogy Talk page, and um, this was from Kevin McGrath. So and what he asked was, um, he goes, what's still missing from the sport? Not just exposure on a professional level, but what is missing that makes people want to play tournaments? And Derek kind of, uh, I'll start with this one, but Derek kind of started with it is, the, one of the things to bring people to the tournaments is you've gotta have the funds to do it. Um, you, if you just have a tournament based on entry fee, you're very limited to what you can do. And I think you're really relying on then their experience of how they perform. And most people don't play the way they want to play, and especially the first time when you're playing a tournament, you know, where you've got to wait your turn, you've got holdups on cards, you've got to put your mini marker down, you've got to watch your stance, you're worrying about noise, you're used to playing with music on, playing out loud, you know, or things like that. Maybe you have alcohol or something like that, and you don't have any of that in the tournament. So their focus is on the tournament. I think some of the things that would help make people enjoy those tournaments more is kind of what we're talking about with the GBO is but it's better experiences you know and a lot of that better experience comes with money and fundraising um, but I think tournaments on a separate note too are it's a niche interest I think there's so many things in our sport that you can do that can be exposed to the outside world that don't have to do with tournaments tournaments are not everybody likes to compete some people just want to play. Some people just want to play with their four buddies and that's it. Some people want to be the best in the world. So I think as far as what's missing from the sport, um, um, I guess I don't know if I have an answer to the specific question of what's missing from the sport that ultimately makes tournaments better, but I guess my, my first thought is it's just uh, appealing more to those individuals' interest, um, providing more options for people. I'm not even sure I answered. I feel like question. it depends. Um, <laughs> though those that are coming out, though, I, I think it's different on, in different situations. I mean, you got some people that are going out there and they want to see an awesome player's back. Maybe they know their their odds aren't good at winning or whatever. So for them, you know, a good player's back is going to bring them to a tournament. Or maybe you know a guy who's more on the elite side or better in his division, like you before you you know before you go to open when you're an advanced. It's more about the payout for you because you know you you go out there, and your odds of winning are extremely what well, you know extremely yeah. good. So for you maybe it's not about the it's that it's more about the payout. Yeah. You know, and so every I feel like every tournament's different. I see tournaments where it's player pack only, mm -hmm. and I always hear people talk down on them and stuff like that. But then I see you know stuff that has payout, and while the payout may go. 40% down down or 50% down, there's still those that don't get paid and, and they're really just, they know when they go in they're donating their money. So if they're getting a cool players pack, they're happy with that, you know? And uh, and it's like you said, I think a lot of people, there's a lot, and I'm not gonna lie, I'm, I'm actually one of them. I would, I would prefer to go out with four or five of my friends. Now I'm competitive, don't get me wrong, I'm very competitive. It's not easy for me to go out there and just throw multiple shots on every hole and things like that and just practice. I'm very competitive. But it's, I mean, let's just face it's funner to beat, beat your friend, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's it's fun to be competitive within your group of friends, and you don't have to, you know, you may not have to deal with somebody being a douche on your car or something like that. I like when like I that. play with Derek all the time. <laughs> I almost had you out there. At, <laughs> what's that? Good Platypus. Oh, uh, what? Lake, what's, oh, Lake yeah, Perry. Lake Perry, yeah. Lost you on the 18th hole. Don't go bragging. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like 930 rated, so... 
we won't talk about where I am. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it's just. Uh, but it is. I, I, I personally, my my philosophy as a TD is less is more. I run one other than the GBO stuff. You know, I won run one event a year. But I also put almost four thousand dollars into that one event. You know, so I I prefer that one event. You know, you come out there. We have a round. We have win your card prizes. We have catered lunch in between. We have um, raffles going on. We've got CTPs going on. We, I mean, more stuff than I can even count. There's all this stuff going on, and so that whole day is an event, you know. And I don't, I don't feel like, or at least I hope, I hope nobody leaves there not enjoying themselves, regardless of where they've ended up, because I feel like. They know they got well, well more than their money's worth, you know, and it was just fun, you know. They look forward to it, but and and from a TD side, that also, I mean, your events fill quicker, you know. People want to get in your events; they fill fast. They don't sit and lag on for three months, and you're hoping they fill, you know, and it just makes it funner. But I mean, I also know a lot of people like to play golf all the time. You know, they want to play every weekend. So there's no. There's no possible way for a TD to raise the kind of money it takes to run an event like that every weekend. Nor could he even try. I mean, no. I could not even imagine doing that one event multiple times a year. Really? I mean, it's just. Well, it's, I used to run the I used to run twenty some tournaments a year, and I tried to always do those kind of fundraising. And you'd see it. I mean, I could my my events were successful, but then the negative part comes is for me to fundraise and to try to do that for every tournament. Well, then you end up having overstock, and you have extra stuff that comes from a team. Or if you slip and up, it's so noticeable. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if 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 you actually couldn't accomplish quite what you were going for in that one tournament, everybody notices, and they build an expectation. Yeah. Much like the you know, much like the glass blown open players pack or something, they build this expectation of what they think it should be. And the reality is, their expectation is built off of what you've created, and it may be more than they should ever expect, but you. You created that monster in yourself by what you've done, you know, and and so then if it becomes less, then it's suddenly not what they expected, and now they don't want to come or whatever, you know. Yeah. I, it, I mean, false expectation is is a lot of. No, I, I think yeah. building up like the hype behind some TDs is for sure a thing, because like I was, I'm I'm not gonna lie, can you like it? Is that what you run? Yeah, I was January first, eight o'clock in the morning. I was like making sure it wasn't filling up too fast. Just because, like, I know everyone wants to play your tournaments. And, like, I know you give out good players backs because I got friends that are AMs that will play your tournaments and only your tournaments sometimes. Just because. Oh, yeah, there's guys that drive in from Nebraska and yeah. stuff to play to play a Scott Reed tournament. Yeah, just because. And he's like, not all that, really. I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's like. <clears throat> Thanks, guys. You just put, like, so much into your tournaments where yeah, it's like if you have, like, a Scott tournament, like, an hour away versus, mm -hmm. like, just a tournament down the street, like they'll drive the hour instead of down the street just because they know but that's they're going to have a better time. That's something. my focus philosophy, though, is you appeal more to, than just the competition. Yeah. Make sure everybody has a good time. Yeah. And I personally love players' packages, so I do put a lot of focus on players' packages. But there are some events I do that are uh, pay out, like Platypus Open I did last year up in Lake Perry, uh, Kansas, was uh, there was no players' package because. That I wanted to appeal specifically to those people. Um, there's all kinds of different people, and as far as you know, what's going to make it better for people to play in tournaments is it's just it's finding for those who play tournaments. I think you just have to find that that groove, that special thing that's going to make them want to play. And like I said, in some people you're just not going to get them. But at the same time, man, tournaments fill, and we have so many tournaments. There's so many, there's thousands throughout the country, throughout the year. I mean, every week there's tournaments. I don't think filling tournaments for the most part is an issue. There could be parts of the country that sure have a little bit of problems here and there, but from as much as I travel and the network of people I talk to and I've been involved with with various things, tournaments do not have a problem filling. And even there's nothing wrong with saying, uh, I mean, depends on what you have invested into a tournament, but for those tournament directors, you might want 72 or 90 or 144, whatever that number is, but there isn't anything wrong with having a few less than that as well. Yeah. You know, I think just uh, it's setting that, uh, it's just giving those players what they want to, uh, to get them there. So. And I would say that most disc golfers, like, they don't play for competition. I would say 
more than half play just because like it's just a fun thing they can do after work or sure. uh, like on the weekends with their friends. And, and it's, it's an like, ex- inexpensive hobby for yeah. that. Yeah. And you go to the movie theater and pay just as much oh as on God. some of the tournaments. Oh my God, yeah. You know, kinds of stuff for, you know. But, oh. All right, I think we talked on that one for a little bit. So, all right, we have another question that came in from one of our fans up on the Facebook page. And uh, it's just more personal aiming at us three. But uh, what Shane Sandberg asks is, uh, what do we want to do to fix our game in 2019? And uh, how are we going to accomplish that? We'll let Derek go last. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I'll start us off. Uh, I mean, of course, the big one is putting. I mean, who doesn't want to be, like, a better putter? Uh, but uh, uh, I would say right now in the off season, I'm working on my turnovers because I just normally flick if I can. But turnovers do have some benefits. But right now... I'm working on rollers. That's like I don't have like Garrett Gurthy type distance, but like I don't need it yet. But if it's like a 500 foot hole where it's like wide open, I want to lay down a roller and be able to get there. Mm-hmm. So I'm working on that right now. I think that's my goal for 2019. I think we'll hold I want to be able to lay down two rollers and get there. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, um, I guess I I do plan on playing more in 2019. But I, I don't know that I really have the thought on how to be a better player. I do want to be a better player, but I want to have fun. I, but I think, so I've been running tournaments for so long, and I'm really not doing too much in 2019, is I want to learn how to enjoy the game. <clears throat> and I guess one of the things that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is, like, what can I do to enjoy the game? And one of them is creating, like, this podcast is... You know, I have the podcast I'm doing for Kansas City, the KC Discussions, and it's just doing video and drone and doing some media stuff, working with, um, because even there, it's, so for the last few weeks as I've been doing video for the KC Discussions, I haven't been playing the leagues, but I've been having a blast out with the players, just filming. People have already started to see me and just know that I'm going to film and kind of make little jokes here and there. And that's the stuff that I'm looking forward to in 2019 and that's what I would almost call my game. My game is more of me as a person as opposed to what I perform on the course. Yeah, I do want to get better at um, playing overall. I'd like to be better at um, keeping my, I don't say keep my composure, I don't get mad, but just not getting nervous. After 20 some years of playing, I still get nervous. If I shoot three birdies in a row, I start shaking like I'm getting ready to win a title and I'm in the first round. You know, just that's something I've always had problems with, anxiety. But I don't get anxiety or nervous about virtually anything else in life. But I do get nervous with doing that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think that's more of the, what I want to do and just kind of keep working on that stuff. So <laughs> I'm still laughing. For me, it's... God, I don't know what I don't want to get better at. Um, I have the worst forehand in all of disc golf. Um, and th- that's always been something I want to work on. I, I do try to work on it, but I lost cause. Um, putting's pretty bad right now. Uh, I'm wrapping my arm when I reach back. Oh, man, I could go on forever. I need to lose weight. Uh, <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot. Um, one big thing for me is just um, really probably the biggest thing I need to work on is just getting out there more. Um, I'm, I'm lucky to get around in a week right now, you know, between, between family and, and running the business. I'm, I just don't get out there much. And, um, I, I complain to my wife all the time, you know, I, I'm not great. My rating's not great, but my rating's been as high as almost 880 and it's, it's dropped like 20 points over the last year and a half and it just keeps dropping. You know, I can't get out on the course. I can't get out there and play and, there's a lot of frustration in watching your game go backwards because that's the total opposite of what you ever want to see, you know? Yeah. And so instead of my game going up, it's going backwards, you know? And I remember one of my one of my first tournaments on, on a lead card, I played with Jordan Renzelman on the lead card. And now Renzelman's playing open and I'm still back here at 860-something, you know? Yeah. And so that's... Uh, not, not Renzelman's a great player. I wish I could keep up with him. But I feel like... If I could put the work ethic in and stuff that he's probably done over the last, you know, two or three years, you know, I could be at that same, 
you know, at that same area. Instead, I'm, you know, uh, and I'm not going to sit and tell you I don't put the work in because I, you know, because I don't want to. I don't put the work in because I can't find the time to. And I know that's, you know, the typical excuse, but it's just unfortunately how it is. Real. But uh, so for me, yeah, just finding the time, I think, is probably by far my, my biggest goal, you know. Okay. So. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's enough uh, lollygagging for the first episode. Like, get us a good start, kind of figure out how we're going to do this. Um, one of the things that I want to do with the podcast here with my guests, including myself, is I'm going to give uh, each of us an opportunity just to kind of talk about whatever we want to talk about. If we have something we want to promote personally, if we have something that we want to uh, just talk about. It's their time to share what they want to share. And, uh, yeah, I'll let them do that. So, uh, First, like, I would like to thank Scott for giving me the opportunity to be here. I've had a blast so far and can't wait to see what this will develop into. But uh, what's on my mind right now is probably this upcoming season, 2019. It's going to be a fun year with all, like, the sponsorship changes and, like, tournaments growing bigger. The Pro Tour really making a stride to, like, to like take it to the next level uh, I'm excited I'm personally I'm I'm traveling a lot this year <clears throat> even though I'm in college I'm able to I'm going down to Waco for my first big tournament so I'm super excited for that I caddied Chris Clemens last year it was beautiful it was like I don't know it was like 80 degrees outside so that was awesome and to be able to play this year I'm man I have a calendar at my house right now just Marking the days off till I go there. Uh, and then, like, later on in the season, I plan on, like, playing as much as I can over the summer. But second half of my season, when I'm not in school, I'm going to be hitting Idlewild and then just, like, the next Pro Tour events after that. I think I'll be hitting, like, seven big events. And I think that could – it'll take my game up playing with better players. So I'm super excited for that. And, yeah, that's all I got. All right, so what's on my mind? I'm really looking forward to the 2019 season. I'm looking forward to the Las Vegas Challenge and the Memorial. I'm signed up for both at MP40. I'm going to play a few Pro Tour events. I don't have a lot on my schedule as far as tournaments. I'm not running a World Championship this year, so I'm going to get to be a player. But I'm also going to do more with the podcasting, more videoing, various things like that. Try to get a little bit more involved in the media side. I'm very excited about learning that stuff. I have a lot to learn. Every time I think I'm getting a grasp on it, I don't. So uh, any input's always appreciated. But one of the big projects that we work on, and this will be our second year, is at the Glassblown Open on the Tuesday, the day of the Players Package Distribution, at the Art Gallery next door to the Granada, we do a collector exhibit between me and Derek Brookard. Last year we had the prototypes, a few bags, a few uh, various discs, but the niche fo showcase of that was the Dynamic Discs Moonshine Air Judge. And I have that full collection. I did a poster of it. We had all those discs on display. It was very exciting for those who came in. We had a few hundred people that came in and saw that. So we wanted to build on that. So the, going into 2019, we won't have that collection. I'll have the poster on there that has the history. We're probably going to have a little bit more first runs rather than prototypes. We're going to have... Um, some other just various discs through there but the niche we're going to focus on this time is going to be on the latitude 64 albatross river i have those discs i'm going to have those on display we're going to have the poster made up for those again and i'm very excited about showcasing that i think it's a collection that a lot of people like but not a lot of people know the history about which i've been researching so going into 2019 those are all the things that are on my mind oh well, let's see. What's on my mind for 2019? Hmm. Um, there's a there's a couple things, a couple big things. Um, probably, I don't want to say the smallest, but the the one you guys will care the least about. I'm I'm excited. Uh, the course of my hometown has been. We've been working on it for quite some time. I had a remodel last year, after some you know poor design work. Um, it was originally put in by a by a park. Um, kind of by a landscaping designer who didn't know a whole lot about disc golf, so he did what he could. Um, finally, we got the permission to go in last year and redesign it. A local, Eric Eastwood, took the head on that, and 
I did a lot of help with him last year. I, he's he's continued to work on it even more through the winter, and so it's it's coming along. I haven't been as big a part of it this winter, um, but it's it's coming along. And I'm told sometime in the spring we're going to get tee pads. So that's super exciting. That's three minutes from my house, which is awesome. Um, <clears throat> then the uh, the news a lot of people have been waiting on um, at the. 2019 GBO Collectors Exhibit that Scott was just talking about. There will be an exclusive disc this year, just like there was last year. However, we've uh, we've worked hard to improve off of last year. There was a few too many last year. Um, as a result, some of those were left over and um, sold later, which has kind of hurt some of the value of them. But this year, we've gone above and beyond. And uh, the disc that we will be putting out this year we have the first 100, and they are all ice clear, and they are prototypes of the Lucid X Escape. Um, they are all 100% completely ice clear with a proto ring stamp on them. Um, so we're super, super excited about those. You will be able to get your hands on a Lucid X Escape prior to GBO. I believe Match Play is doing those. Um, but if you want the proto with the ring on the ice clear disc, one of the first 100, you will have to come by that GBO collector's exhibit and get yourself one of those. Um, so we are super excited about that. Um, and the last thing, uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time over the last six months or so really, really, really trying to figure out a good way to take advantage of DD's um, exclusive mold program and find something that works for everyone. There's so many options out there you can create so many different things um but i think we finally settled on one it is already in production and we are going to be releasing the classic blend verdict um, that will be exclusive through truly unique and there will actually be some variations of it i believe we will have strawberry scented classic blend verdicts as well as blueberry blend classic did i say that right blueberry classic blend verdicts um, as well as Moonshine Classic Blend Verdicts. And then if, if none of those um, interest you, we will just have the basic Classic Blend Verdict. Um, there will be some stamp variations and things like that as well. I'm not going to get too far into too much detail yet. But uh, the hope, if those arrive as they should, is we will launch those at the Glass Blown Open, and then they will follow online to anyone who, who wants to get one. So... Um, that's probably what I'm most excited about for 2019. Um, I do have other plans for a couple other exclusive molds, possibly nothing I can discuss quite yet. So, um, that would be, that would be what I'm most excited about for this year. So, and, uh, before I finish, Scott, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I've never done a podcast, nor have, do I love being behind a camera, but here we are. So hopefully we'll do this again. Once again, I want to thank you guys for watching us and tuning in. Uh, share this with your friends. Share this throughout the Trilogy Disc Golf community. Subscribe to the YouTube page. Let's try to make this a, a big thing. I think a lot of people want to hear what we discuss, whether or not you want to hear us talk about it. I can't control that. But uh, I do want to um, talk about what you want to hear. So make sure you share those ideas. I want to thank Dallas Wrinkle and Derek Burkert for coming out here with me today to sell to work on this inaugural podcast. Um, thanks for watching again, and you guys all have a good day.